I just want to start with a, a poem which I have brought today. And uh, it's called, the, it's the Latin uh, word for earthworm is the title of the poem, which is Lumbricus Terrestris. And it's by somebody called Rosemary Vatola Troma. And I thought it's a beautiful uh, way to set the stage, quote unquote, for this little teaching which I'd like to share with you today. So, Lumbricus Terrestris. On a day when the world is weighty, dark and dense with need, I want to be the earthworm that gives itself over to tunneling. It's every movement as an act of bringing spaciousness. And when minutes feel crushed by urgency, I want to meet the world worm-like, which is to say grounded, consistent, even slow. No matter how desperate the situation, the worm doesn't tunnel faster, nor burrow more. It knows it can take decades to build fine soil. To whatever is compacted, the worm offers its good worm work, quietly bringing porosity to what is trodden, compressed. So often in my rush to repair, I end up exhausted. Let my gift to the world be my constancy, a devotion to openness, my willingness to be with what is. Let my gift to myself be patience as I tend what is dense and dark. Let my gift to the world be my constancy, a devotion to openness, my willingness to be with what is. Let my gift to myself be patience as I tend what is dense and dark. So this openness you know, towards our own experience in the body and also towards what comes to us from the so-called outside. This openness is, you know, very important and for example, you know, Ajahn Chah, who has been the founder of the lineage, you know, we all three of us have trained in, he spoke quite sometimes about earthworm practice as a, as a practice of uh, patient perseverance, you know, which is the most important basic ingredients for a successful practice, you know, that, that steadiness. And the Pali term for that is upeka which can be you know, translated in different ways. And a synonym for upeka is the word, uh, I have it written down, is the word tatra macha tata, which means there in the middleness, you know, in the middleness between getting completely lost in what is happening and turning away from what is happening. Finding the middle ground of, uh, you know, staying open, but at the same time also grounded. And, uh, you know, the word upeka features quite several times, you know, in those lists of the early Buddhist canon. And, you know, two of the listings I find most important to, to consider for our practices, you know, as a, as a factor of awakening, bochanga, Upeka is uh, translated as equipoise, which means, uh, you know, in the, in the dictionary, equipoise is uh, explained as an equal distribution of weight. Like if you're in a, in a kayak, in a boat, you know, going down the river, 
being, you know, not too much on the right, not too much on the left, being in the middle and because of that, you know, being able to move with the current. And so that's one way and that's a, an equipoise towards our own mind states. And then Upeka can also be, you know, seen as a Brahma Vihara, as a limitless uh, quality of the mind. And in that context, it is uh, translated as equanimity, and in particular, equanimity towards the mind state of others. So first, you know, we need equipoise with our own mind states, and from that grounding, we can also have equanimity towards what comes to us from the so-called outside. And in this way, openness, you know, is kept. And because by nature, you know, we are open systems, because we are in constant exchange, you know, with the biosphere through eating, drinking, breathing, learning from others. Have in being in relationship with others, so keeping that open from a sense of groundedness and from a sense of uh, connectedness. And in this way, we start to change. And th the third way, you know, how the word upeka can be uh, looked at is as a paramita one of the ten perfections, also one of those lists in early Buddhism. And in that context, it is um, translated as serenity. Clear, calm mind. And uh, so those three different ways you know, of looking at Upeka as equipoise, equanimity, and serenity. I think this is a very important medicine at these times, you know, where there is so much confusion and uh, complexity and kind of an inability to really figure it all out. It's, you know, even we have more and more powerful computers, more and more powerful technology, but the capacity, you know, to really figure it out, it's getting less and less. So because of that, I think it's really important to remember to come back into the body with this sense of upeka and to trust, you know, that the body is a different kind of intelligence. It's a bigger brain in a way we can say, which is in constant exchange with the bigger biosphere who is you know, evolving as this planet for more than four and a half billion years without anybody of us directing it. So it obviously knows what to do. So for me, you know, I really think at this time, at this threshold time where we start to understand that we cannot solve all of the issues which are upon us with the intellect, with the thinking mind. The thinking mind can be uh, support, and we need the intellect and all of its wonders, you know, which it has been able to create. But it needs to be informed by a different way of understanding ourselves. And I think that way is about really understanding on a direct experiential level that we are part of a living intelligent earth who knows what to do. And we need to train ourselves, you know, to be able to sense and feel into this deep embeddedness in the biosphere. Because generally, you know, our education in this modern world is all about training the intellect. And now we need to remember that there have been times, you know, when our species has been living in much more in harmony with the biosphere. And we have lost, you know, this capacity to sense and feel 
because of our the overemphasis on the intellect. And there is still, you know, people left of our species who have some of those memories still alive, mostly indigenous people, which make up about 5%, you know, of the world population. It's about 460 million indigenous people living at this point, and they take care of about 80% of the biodiversity. So there's a huge imbalance. And just taking that in, you know, and knowing that we are also from indigenous lineages, of course, all of us. So this information, you know, is available to us. It's, it's part of our heritage, you know, through having these homo sapiens mammalian bodies. So to, it's, and it's also not about, you know, going back and live in the jungle or something like that, but it's about coming full circle and bringing together our intellectual capacities with the grounding of the knowing, you know, that these bodies are part of a living intelligent earth and they have emerged out of that earth through the help of our mothers. And when they get old and die, they're gonna go back. There's composting funerals available these days, you know, which is a very elegant way to go back. So to allowing that uh, to sink in, you know, that these bodies are actually, you know, riding animals for consciousness. So consciousness can make experiences and expand, expand, you know, until there's no more separation. And, you know, the Buddhist teaching has a lot of uh, supportive practices for, for that, in particular, you know, the first establishment of mindfulness about the body is the practice of the elements and the body parts and, you know, reflection on the mortality of the body. There's are three powerful practices which can reconnect us in this way and, you know, bringing the Buddha's teaching into this time of waking up for our species that we are all part of a living intelligent earth and we can't all go to Mars or do something crazy like this. But we have to practice here. We have to make it work here. And we are all together in this. And combining, you know, our practice of trying to liberate ourselves from samsara with an expansion of perception about what it means to be a human being at this time. The Buddha's teaching comes to us, you know, from Iron Age India, and there was no climate crisis at that point. So there was no need to think or speak about those issues, but it's different now. So, you know, do whatever we can't be in relationship with, whatever we can't sense or feel, we need to overthink. And then we're just gonna be, you know, five hindrances in the head, turning it over and over and over, and reinforcing those habits, rather than finding skillful ways to outgrow those habits by coming back into the body and being in relationship to our own experience, direct experience. And I, you know, would like to share a guided meditation rather than talking about it, because that's also, you know, conceptual uh, understanding which can be shared through talking. And this is like signposts, you know, but then we really need to turn towards where those signposts are pointing. Otherwise, they are rather pointless. So let us um, just sense again the body sitting and uh, breathing in and breathing out.
and you know you don't have to do anything difficult or special just opening your mind opening your heart to the guidance and, and allowing your mind to respond that's you know the mind being filled with what is experienced in the present moment that's what mindfulness is all about allowing your mind to be full with present moment experience which is just the body sitting and uh, breathing in and breathing out. And the gravity which gently pulls us towards the ground, showing us you know, where we come from, where these bodies have arisen from. And also being aware of the community, everybody who is here. We are doing this together. And with the out breath, you know, gently imagining we are sending down some roots into the soil underneath this building, no pressure. The roots in which go down into the soil, which is made up of lots of uh, life forms, you know, which have died, plant material, animals, human beings. It's a very rich, dark presence, which is alive. And, you know, like an earthworm, we can turn towards it rather than being just interested what is extracted. And, you know, transformed into all kinds of amazing stuff. So seeing, you know, if we can sense the presence of the earth underneath this building. Well, whatever, you know, happens is there a sense of numbness or boredom, confusion. What is present in the mind as you're opening to this guidance? So breathing up the, the stillness, the vastness, the richness of the earth. You know, as it uh, enters the body and earth element in the body is in particular the bones and the teeth and I'm breathing up that stability and then a sweeping from the tips of the toes, slowly sweeping up the legs with our awareness 
and then sensing the bones, the hardness and structure of earth element. How it holds up our bodies. And then from the legs we come to the hips, the pelvis, and then the torso with the rib cage and the spine, bones, earth element. And then the hands and the arms, bones, earth element. Shoulders, bones, earth element. The neck, the vertebrae, bones, earth element. And then the skull and the jaw, the teeth, bones, earth element. This whole body is permeated by earth element. Earth element internally in the bones and earth element externally in the mountains, the rocks and the concrete of the cities is exactly the same earth element. Earth element is empty, empty of a self. And if we don't ingest earth elements through food for one or two months, the body is going to collapse. The body is in constant exchange and never cuts the umbilical cord towards the biosphere, the earth. And in order for earth element you know, to form a body, there needs to be cohesion, and that brings us to the next element, which is the water element which stands for flow, wetness, and cohesion. Like putting water into a bowl of flour, it's gonna become a dough. And we can sense the water element in the softness of the flesh, which is permeated you know, by lots of liquids, consisting about 70, 75% of water element. So we start now on the top of the head and the head itself and sensing the wetness in the mouth and in the eyes and also the softness of the flesh, the cheeks. Softness, flesh, water element. And then we sweep down to the neck. Softness, flesh, water element. And from the neck we are coming to the shoulders, softness, flesh, water element. Down the arms and hands, softness, flesh, water element. And then the torso with all of the organs inside. Softness, flesh, water element. The hips, the pelvis, softness, flesh, water element. Legs and the feet, softness, flesh, water element. This whole body is permeated by water element. Water element internally in the flesh and water element externally in the rivers, the lakes, the rains and the ocean is exactly the same water element. Water element is empty empty of a self. And if we don't take in water element for about 
five, six days, the body is going to shut down. There needs to be a constant exchange. And we never cut the umbilical cord towards the planet, the biosphere. We are inside of it, like an earthworm. And we are now at the threshold of the evolution of our species where that becomes conscious because of the pressure of the climate crisis. And in order for water element to form a body, it needs to be of a certain temperature. If it's too hot, it evaporates. If it's too cold, it's freezing, becomes hard. So that brings us to the next element, which is the fire element, which we can sense on the surface of the skin, where the skin meets the air in the room. Maybe you experience it as neutral, cool, or warm. That depends on the temperature of your body. We are starting again, you know, at the tips of the toes, skin, temperature, fire element. And sweeping up the legs, to the hips, skin, temperature, fire element. Over the torso, skin, temperature, fire element. The hands and the arms, skin, temperature, fire element. The shoulders and the neck. Skin, temperature, fire element. The head, skin, temperature, fire element. This whole body is permeated by fire element. Fire element externally coming to us from the sun and from the center of the planet is exactly the same fire element. Fire element is empty, empty of a self. And you know, we can ex extend the range within which a body can live sustainably through housing and clothing and heating, but it is limited. And f depending on the resources we extract from the planet, So to just let it drop in how we are participants of the planet. We are not separate. This is an old paradigm which is now falling apart. And through the cracks, you know, we can see the new paradigm starting to emerge. And understanding that we are part of a living intelligent earth and we need to listen how we can contribute to more sustainable practices for the benefit of future generations. The responsibility of taking on that challenge and not waiting for somebody else to rescue us. It's a one-by-one one realization, like the whole teaching. It has to be realized individually, but otherwise. And, you know, Heat and cold is, is a result of friction, which takes us to the next element, which is the wind element, which stands for expansion and contraction, stands for pressure, 
and movement and we experience it through the breathing process. The breathing in the oxygen which is coming to us from the plant life. All of the oxygen on this uh, in this planet was created by plant life and some also some plankton life. And sensing the in breath and the out breath. You know, and not breathing for three, three to seven minutes, and the body is going to shut down. It's an immediate relationship with the biosphere. And allowing all of that to sink in, you know, and the Buddha's teaching is not a descriptive teaching telling us, you know, what it is, fire element, what it is, wind element, but it gives us a prescription how we can directly experience it through sensing into it, through this, the nervous system of those bodies, you know, which have been evolving on this planet since over four and a half billion years, is the accumulated capacity of long, long, long time of evolution. An increasing, you know, complexification and capacity for bringing awareness to those processes. It's what we are doing right now in this very simple, direct sensing and feeling rather than writing endless books about it and not being able to embody it. So it's time for all of this to come down into embodiment. So it really makes a difference and preserves, you know, what is still there so that future generations have a place to land as well. And trusting, you know, the intelligence of this self-regenerative intelligent being we call planet Earth. It knows what to do. But we need to listen. And, you know, using the information lines, you know, which are all there through eating, drinking, breathing, the earth in the body and the earth in the bigger body of this planet is the same earth element, the same water element, the same fire element, the same wind element. Trusting that. And whenever fear arises, confusion, agitation, numbness, bringing spaciousness to that, like an earthworm, a humility, a consistency, a willingness to be part of this vast mystery. which talks to us, but not through words. Whatever we can sense or feel, 
we need to overthink. And then we get all caught up in rushing and quicker and more. Which is just repeating the same thing all over again. Because, you know, the level of consciousness which created this crisis can't solve it from that same level. It's just repeating. But there needs to be a dropping in. And there's a beautiful uh, saying by a well-known teacher called Bayo Akumulafe, and he says, times are urgent. We need to slow down. And then all around us, space element, and also throughout the body, listening into that spaciousness, which doesn't end at the walls of the room, limitless space, and silence. And you know, opening ourselves to the unknown, opening ourselves to what we don't know yet. From a sense of grounding and you know, willingness to understand what is being asked of us. And that's a process. Because it's the way of looking at what it means to be a human being at these times, which needs to be adjusted. You know, understanding ourselves as participants rather than victims or controllers. We are participants. Trying to control is one extreme, and being a victim is another one. And the middle path is to be a participant on the Noble Eightfold Path at this time. And before we are ending, I'm just going to read the poem one more time. Lumbricus Terrestris. On a day when the world is weighty, dark and dense with need, I want to be the earthworm that gives itself over to tunneling, its every movement as an act of bringing spaciousness. And when minutes feel crushed by urgency, I want to meet the world worm-like, which is to say grounded, consistent, even slow. No matter how desperate the situation, the worm does not tunnel faster, nor burrow more. It knows it can take decades to build fine soil. To whatever is compacted, the worm offers its good worm work, quietly bringing porosity to what is trodden, compressed. So often, in my rush to repair, I end up exhausted. Let my gift to the world be my constancy, a devotion to openness, my willingness to be with what is, let my gift to myself be patience as I tend what is dark and dense.
So just noticing, you know, how that feels in the body, to hear those words, to sense into the non-separation of the body from the bigger body of the planet. And then, you know, coming back to the breathing again. Yeah, as we are slowly, you know, getting ready to come out of the meditation and, uh, you know, noticing you are not alone in this practice. We are doing this together. And we can have, you know, some time for comments or if there's any one who would like to clarify something, what has been said. Andamayam damakatayu sadhu karang dharama se sadhu 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 Anumodami. Okay, so we can open things up. Thank you very much, Aya. Mm -hmm. yeah, so if anyone has any questions, uh, we have Miles as a mic runner, so you can just raise your hand. And we'll bring a microphone to you so everybody can hear. And also on Zoom, if you have any questions or reflections to share, uh, you can just raise your cute little cartoon hand and we'll call on you there. So I have a question. You mentioned that um, you see humanity or we're coming to a point of, um, I forget the word you chose, Threshold? Like threshold? Threshold, yes. Um, what, what, can you explain what you mean more by that? I, I, I see as more running towards into a wall, personally, but that's just yeah, another that's, perspective. That's one way how, you know, if you choose to see it as a wall, it's going to be a wall. You know, it, it really depends, the way of looking, what is, ex what is happening. And I, I see it more like a waking up you know, to understanding that we are participants of the planet and not separate. That's, you know, that's the, in a simple way what is happening, you know, for our species. And there is, you know, always when we stand on a threshold, then there's always those, you know, who want to go back into the past and, and those who are kind of hesitant on the threshold itself, not really getting it yet because it requires practice, you know, to really understand. And those who, who understand and, and try to go, you know. And, yeah. Thank you, Haya. Um, the line from the poem of our gift being or constancy mm -hmm. just really struck me. Could you speak some more about that idea of constancy? Yeah. You know, constancy is like this earthworm like, uh, you know, patient perseverance or upeka, however we want to call it, you know, to. Uh, be okay to not know, you know, rather than saying it's it's a wall and we're just going to all die, to say, I don't really know what's going to happen. And I'm applying myself to whatever is in, in front of me, this constancy, you know, whatever is in front of my nose like an earthworm, you know, and, and not trying to fig figure it out in the head, but, you know, going into the body and sensing, oh, you know, I feel there's a lot of fear and, and then I'm making my mind up a concept that I'm in front of a wall in order to make sense of my experience. But to rather be with the, however it feels in the body, you don't need to 
make a story out of it, you know. That willingness to feel and sense, you know, the basically the first two establishments of mindfulness, to be in that experience and then see what it throws up in the mind, you know. Like this would be the third establishment of mindfulness, seeing, oh, you know, there is aversion. I, I rather don't want to be here. And then, and then aversion can manifest as fear, as anxiety, as hatred, whatever you want, you know. And being conscious of that and then making a choice to not give in to that. That's the constancy, you know, to be with the unpleasant feeling, the contraction in the body, and not split it off into the head and make a story out of it, and then wallow in that story, you know, endlessly. But just whenever you notice it, you drop the story and you come back into sensing and feeling. And that's, you know, how we metabolize, how we digest together. You know, because we're all afraid, we're all confused, you know, on one day more than on another. And, and that's the work, you know. And through the met metabolizing of, by feeling and sensing, you know, more clarity arises because we have the, you know, that's like how you are, or how I am uh, cultivating what's called the seven factors of awakening, you know, by being willing to be in the experience of the five hindrances, you know, and not losing myself there, but coming back into the body and making, you know, creating openness, you know, like an earthworm, but the contraction, you know, of, uh, you know, wanting to defend oneself against that which is scary. So, you know, and, and for us, um, you know, particular, uh, all you know, people here in that room, you know, probably all of us quite educated, you know. We haven't really, um, you know, gotten much uh, conditioning in terms of sensing and feeling, yeah. It's all about like figuring it out in the head and the concepts, the languaging, and all of that. Also, you know, being really careful with languaging, because languaging really determines how we think, and then how we think determines and what we see, and then we are, we are stuck in that box, you know? And then we think, oh, just let me kind of make an end to all of it, because it's, it's an impenetrable wall. But it's, it's only like that if you think it's like that, and if you sign on to that, that's what you co-create, you know. But you can also humble yourself and experience the way we are in constant exchange with the biosphere and there is no wall. Yeah. Oh, sorry, and maybe you w would like to say something to those things too, or not, I don't know. Yeah, no, just a... Uh such mm -hmm. a beautiful poem and uh, a great question too about constancy and uh, mm -hmm. I think it's such a common theme that you see with practitioners, definitely see it with myself, is that you first hear about Buddhism, you hear about Nirvana and you think, oh, I do a weekend retreat and it's going to be where I am, way up to Nibbana and I just keep on that constant, you know, weekend push. Uh, but you do it and you do it over the and, and it takes longer than a weekend, and you think, oh, I do my week-long retreat, and that's going to be the constant up to Nibbana. I do my three-month retreat, my three-year retreat. I be for you know, three decades or however long, and then Nibbana. And it is, the earthworm is such a humbling practice because however long we've been in the path, you hit those rocks, you hit a rock, and it's like we're working both with our ethics, the sila, our meditation, the samadhi, and our wisdom, we just keep hitting these rocks and it's not constantly up. It's we got to go hit a rock and then we actually go down and around and we have a plateau. And uh, yeah, you just have to have the constancy is, the constancy itself varies over time. Our capacity for being constant and what that actually means varies. And so constancy of sincerity, I think is something that you definitely see at monasteries, and honestly, you can see in a community like this, 
uh, how enlightened any individual one of us is, can't really say, but they're very sincere places and the constancy of that sincerity over time because uh, in Theravada, it is a long game. And um, yeah, it's a gradual awakening and we do have sudden insights. Uh, so we need to do both at the same time and the constancy is just a key, key factor. So earthworm humility. Just one small thing, maybe, in addition to those really beautiful comments, um, just that I think when you step into practice, um, I think the earthworm really is a good analogy because it's like we really think, you know, before we practice, we map the landscape onto this landscape we're walking over, and there's this whole other strata of being you're moving through when you begin to practice, and it's always available. So someone was saying today that when they're in pain, it's much easier to be mindful. And um, there's this one quote from a sutta um, where this non-venerable Dhammadina says, pleasant feeling is pleasant when it remains and painful when it changes. Painful feeling is painful when it remains and pleasant when it changes. Neutral feeling is, I think, unpleasant or neutral when experienced without mindfulness and pleasant when experienced with mindfulness unpleasant when experienced without mindfulness, pleasant when experienced with mindfulness. So just all things equalizing in the face of the heart that holds it all as practice. I think that's a beautiful idea of consistency as well. Um, we have a Zoom question. I, if yeah. we can call on Vandana, is that who it is? Yes. Yes, yes Sajan Vandana. <laughs> so, greetings, Aya. It was a very, very powerful thought uh, talk <laughs> and a thought <laughs> for everyone to uh, keep reminding that Dhamma is here right now. We don't have to go anywhere to uh, uh, learn the Dhamma. Dhamma is in everywhere around you. And the five element uh, meditation, which you guided, it's, it's just so close to my heart always that seeing myself, all these uh, elements interacting with outer and internal world, and but uh, one thing which I noticed just now that even with all the elements, uh, even uh, the earth, fire, water, I start to see the space in them. I don't know if it's a, a new thing coming up or what, but in all of them, it's like everything is just coming. It's not. It's like earthworm, right? The earthworm is uh, keep on refining the soil, and there is nothing left, and then it's all pure, and then. Earth is going to reproduce, 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 and the earthworm is going to do its job no matter how much time it takes. So it's such a beautiful, beautiful, I would say that I think uh, there's such a, my heart feels so happy. That's what I want to say. So, so much gratitude, so much respect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I uh, so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is really appreciated. I am professionally trained as a biologist. Now, starting from today, I'll think of myself as an earthworm, going constant uh, speed, working on something, whatever I need to work on, and yet still have this umbilical cord attached to the earth. That's something I've never imagined, and it's so uh, empowering, enlightening. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, it's really, you know, to see the sinking makes such a huge difference, you know. And it can open up a sense of enrichment and, and embeddedness, you know, in something so much bigger than oneself. Or it can be like a wall, you know. You choose. You, you are in control how you want to condition your mind. Do you want to condition it towards, you know, a, a greater sense of... Uh, openness or uh, do you want to you know kind of shut down and once you notice that that is up to you that's that's so much you know central to the buddhist practice this is why it is liberating because we are open systems in naturally you know and this this simple meditation i shared with you is a way how we can experience that truth you know that we are open systems and we can choose how we want to engage with that truth.
Aya, thank you so much for the, the practice today. Um, when I think about the, the, the planet, um, my mind can expand um, and include it all, but it can also expand and get overwhelmed with the massive amount of suffering on the planet. And so in training in this way, I, I know that maybe it would be wise to sort of make smaller and smaller, um, take smaller and smaller pieces at a time, yeah. right? Like in, in some traditions, it's like one day at a time or one hour at a time, one minute at a time, one breath at a time. So could you give some maybe examples of workable things that are maybe in various size increments that we can, actionable things that we can do yeah, for example, you know, the practice I was just sharing, that's something you can do every day, you know, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever, you know, and, and if you feel, you know, a sense of uh, feeling cold, you know, to contribute in some way, if we do, for example, a practice like that, you know, which helps to have more clarity about the fact, you know, that we are all participants of the planet rather than just on top of it, being either victims or being dominators of it. If you, if you, through this practice, you know, become more realistic who you really are as a human being, then in that sense, you know, you are, it will become, it will start to dawn on you what your contribution is, you know, according to your skills, according to your gifts, your talents, you know, we all contribute in different ways. Nobody else can tell you what you should do but to recognize, to be more clear who you are as a human being, that is a good basis to find out for yourself, you know? And not on your own, to do it in community, you're not alone in this, you know? And, and then see what, uh, you know, what emerges uh, for you, because there, is, there will be a response, you know? As you are making yourself more available by by being, by doing the practices and opening up, you know, these wrong understandings, it, it will dawn on you, it will become clear, you know, and it's not going to be necessary quick fix, you know, but it requires that humility, you know, and uh, because it's a crisis of humility, actually, you know, the whole crisis is a crisis of humility, and we all need to do that practice, you know, and to, you have to Put your money where your words are, you know, so to say. Do it. And it will emerge. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I, if I can just add that uh, the root of the word humility is humus, yeah. earth, so I'm sure you yeah. know that, but it, it's and good. And human, you know, human, humility, humus, and not to forget humor. You know, because we always want to have it the easy way, you know. Who wants to be an earthworm? It's not very sexy, you know, it's not very flamboyant, but that's what it is, you know. That's what we are. Huh? What did you say? Sorry, I didn't know the mic was still being passed around while we laugh. Uh, so uh, yeah, my perspective is depending on which earthworm you look at, depending on the uh, journey, which step it's on, you might know, you might not know it has feet. Uh, it doesn't have feet as far as I, what I've seen there, the footless ones. Yeah, uh, well some of them. Have feet? Yes, and there's a way to know, but. Maybe you can show me next time when I'm coming. They do have, uh, James, I think they have... It wasn't my example. They have five or six or seven hearts, which is quite a romantic part about the earthworms. So. I did not know that. Do That's they? so cool. <laughs> really? I did not know they had a heart at all. I yeah. thought it was just like, you know, this white slug and, you know, it's, it's since it's, it's, if, you know, we're on earth, that looks like a worm, earthworm, you know, whatever. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 really, they have several hearts. Yeah, you can. Uh, 
well, you shouldn't do this, but you can cut an earthworm up and it will... Continue. Is that because accurate? I mean, I've been told that. Okay, good. Yeah, but we don't advise this as monastics. No, no, no <laughs> absolutely not. But, you know, maybe they are not as vulnerable, you know, they maybe don't have a centralized heart like we have, but it's spread out throughout the whole body, right? Like a plant life, for example, is like that, very resilient, you know, they, you can cut uh, such a small piece of a plant, it continues to live. So we can learn, you know, actually from other species a lot about adaptation and resilience. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Maybe Arnold on the Zoom? Yes, hello. Thank you so much. I uh, really appreciated that practice. And now I have a new admiration and respect for worms that I haven't had before. And it's uh, even, it's especially funny because I'm a gardener. So, <laughs> That's uh, so important. I also just thought how it's interesting too that you know, they, you, sometimes you see them on the road and stuff when it, after it rains, cause they need oxygen, you know, they need to be able to breathe. But, um, I was thinking of the parallels of this, um, with my uh, Taoist Qigong practice where, uh, there's a practice where you can envision yourself becoming a tree and growing roots and then growing your, your head becomes a crown of branches. And I um, really appreciate the parallels between um, Buddhist practice and Taoist practice in that regard. And uh, thank you so much for reminding me of that and uh, for this practice and uh, being able to be a part of the Sangha today. Thanks. Thank you. Earthworm chi, interesting. Mm -hmm. I wonder what that looks like. Um, well, that might be the last question that we have time for this morning. Um, could we do one more? Do we have, okay, let's go. Can't see your name from here. Marianne? Hi, yes, that's right, thank you. Thank you, Aya. Um, something that really stood out to me during the, the meditation on the elements was the empty of self, you know, the fire element, empty, empty of self, and really being able to feel that also the impersonalness of that in my own experience. And that just felt really important. I wonder if there's anything else you can share about the idea of, of non-self or the idea of selfing and how that is connected to the situation that we're in, a climate crisis. Thank you. I mean, I think that would be a huge, you know, long answer, but we don't have much time. But I, I think, you know, the... The experience of self is always, you know, connected with some kind of suffering, right? Some kind of uh, an experience, separation, and a contraction, and to just, you know, see the the link between that, the, you know, identifying as a self, is productive of suffering, and to, you know, through practice to start to question that and and. you know, slowly but surely opens that up, brings more spaciousness, and then temporarily, you know, we can experience a liberation from that in the meditation when thought activity stops. But there's also a permanent ending of that, and that's the goal of the practice. So, as simple as that. <laughs> or as difficult as that. Thank you, Aya. Thank you. So uh, we can come to the part of the morning where we kind of share uh, just mentally and from the heart uh, all the goodness that we've done together this